Uh, we're talking. We're going to talk about uh, routine poultry mortalities as opposed to the mass mortalities that Melissa was talking about. Um, and if you look, uh, if you try to find some uh, referee journal articles, there's very little on routine. Uh, a lot of a lot of efforts been going into mass mortalities, but our farmers in Oklahoma and elsewhere, they're more concerned with that day to day. How do I keep up with dead birds that are that are piling up, so to speak? Okay, yeah. This uh, this funding, this was a project from the Chesapeake Bay uh, program. And what's the guy from Oklahoma working with the Chesapeake Bay? If you're aware of their, the way they do the programming is they'll call an expert panel. So we actually put together a, a panel of experts from all over the country. Uh, experts, if you're in the, if you work with mortalities much, a lot of these people you'll see in a, in a lot of areas. This particular uh, on the poultry, uh, Bud Malone, who used to be the extension specialist, poultry specialist in Delaware, he did a lot of the finding of the data. It's really hard to find data on mortalities, particularly for broilers. So he did a lot of, uh, Rogo helped me. Um, I read his previous expert panel uh, work on turkeys and then Phil Clare was helping us with the, with the laying hens from Pennsylvania. What the Bay wanted to know was how much nutrients was going into the, the bay or to the model from mortalities, okay? And so we came up with an answer. Nitrogen, phosphorus, these were, what we're looking at the characteristic animals is would be, if you look in the census of ag for a particular type of farm, um, for instance, if a cow-calf herd, or actually, if we're looking at broilers for six pound market birds, we came up with a number for how many pounds of nitrogen, how many pounds of phosphate per year, or total phosphorus per year. That turned out one of probably the most significant finding was if you look at the grand scheme of things, what we're doing for, for a typical farm or for any farm, we combined what theoretically you should get from the, the mortalities with what you should theoretically get from manure and then said, 1.3 to 2.4 percent of the nitrogen is actually going to come from the mortalities. So the bay, when they do their next uh, version of the model, they may decide we're going to throw it in with manure, but we're not going to worry about it. Um, as it turned out, they were looking at using our data for this iteration of the model, but when we started putting the weird losses we have from composting and whatnot, it really threw their model off. So they're gonna keep doing what they were doing. And then when the next version comes out in a couple of years, they may update it. So what we are trying to do is to get accurate numbers based on these different animal systems um, that reflect what a farmer is gonna see in reality. The way the model works now, the way the Bay is estimating now, they'll take for broilers, uh, the annual loss, death loss, mortality loss, and they'll say, I'll apply that to an average size bird. So that's not very accurate. So if you know broilers, and the good thing about what I'm gonna to talk to you today, when we go to producers, it's like, tell me something I don't know. You know, it's encouraging that our results actually back up their experience. So what we did for broilers, and I'm gonna talk exclusively about broilers today, is we took the growth curve, and this is data from provided by um, the companies. These are four different lines that are prevalent in Delmarva Peninsula. And so this is the average growth curve and those error bars are the 95% um, error for, for those four uh, lines. So it's not a linear growth to begin with. The other thing is that the birds don't die in a linear fashion. You have a lot of deaths at first and then you get to when they're, you know, they're fairly larger teenagers, they don't die quite as much, and then they die at the end, okay? This data, like I was alluding to earlier, was really hard to come by. Um, believe it or not, poultry companies just don't want you to know how their birds die uh, before they put, you in, put them in a flock. 
So BUD was instrumental. The NRCS data actually came from a model they were using to size freezers to, to sell to, they freeze the birds and send them to the renderer. The industry data, I don't know where it came from. Some large integrator in um, the Chesapeake Bay, he got the data that they're, uh, when we go to publish this, it may be interesting to see if we can actually get it published. Incidentally, before I started on this project, I had been using mortality data that came out of the commercially, or the research farm in Savoy, Arkansas. And it looks an awful lot the same. Um, but these are for actually for birds that are antibiotic free. So nowadays they didn't want to use that old data because they were all antibiotic birds. And, uh, antibiotic, um, what they call the, they, they vaccinate them in the egg. So they were antibiotic, for, these are antibiotic free. So you combine those two, the growth and the, uh, the mortality, and you can end up with what we're showing here is the weight of mortalities per flock of 1,000 birds um, that they collect at the end of each week or during the week, okay? You can see it fits a nice exponential curve. Uh, a lot of little chicks die at first, but they're not very big, so they don't add much mortalities. In fact, in the next couple of slides, uh, in that first week for a 25,000 bird house, which is one of the smaller ones now, you might collect 14 pounds a day, okay? Uh, once you reach week number five, and they're about a five pound bird, uh, you may collect 68 pounds a day. And then when they're big, and we, were, we went on a little field trip out on the, the eastern shore of Maryland, once they get above about six pounds is when they really start to die. You know, they have a lot of heat stress, they're bigger birds, and they're, they're crammed close together. So then your death rate really starts to increase in their big birds. So for an eight pound, toward the end of an eight pound bird flock, market weight flock, you may be collecting 140 pounds a day. If we went back, if I was a really good mathematician, I would integrate that growth curve, that, that uh, the weekly death curve, but uh, we just add them up and get a cumulative amount of uh, mortalities collected. And being, it's relative child play, and since we the, have the minds of children, we put it back together for the cumulative production for a grow out period. For instance, if you're growing four pound birds for that entire four weeks, four or five weeks, you may be collecting 40 pounds for a thousand pound, for a thousand birds, okay? If you're growing 10 pound birds, you're collecting 250, five times as much. Um, so one of the problems we have in Oklahoma particularly is when a lot of the producers were getting cost share to build disposal methods, they were growing four pound birds. In the 90s, they were growing four and six pound birds. Now they're growing eight and 10 pound birds and it's almost impossible to manage those systems anymore. So this data we can use to go in, uh, we will get, Bud and I will get this published at some point, I'm afraid I screwed it up. I don't wanna end the show. Next. So what can you do with this information? Um, in uh, the Bay and also in the state of Oklahoma, we basically have five disposal methods that we can use. And basically in, in Oklahoma, they're left with incineration and composting. We have no landfills that will accept dead animals since the Cherokee Nation closed down our only landfill that would accept animals. Uh, rendering is, is unheard of anymore. And uh, burial, it's, uh, when you have a, a little bit of birds every week trying to keep a burial pit going, it's just a god awful maggoty mess, to, to put it bluntly. All right. All right. I accidentally hit the pad. So for incineration, you need to excise or, or buy your incinerator to accommodate the largest single day mortality. So for instance, if you're having, well, they should plan on having eight or 10 pound birds basically, and then getting that last week production. 
the daily production. For our bin composters, it's actually a goat composter that they built in Langston, which is our sister institution, our 1890 school. Uh, we need the, the basic size and should be based on that mass for grow out. And if they're following our recommendations, the mass of the volume of birds is actually a very small amount of that. So multiply that by maybe 15 and you get the volume of birds. They're gonna, the volume of space they're gonna need to compost. And they also have to adjust that, adjust that to their daily pattern. Basically, we're, we're layering our compost. Um, we put down, uh, in Oklahoma, we generally put down a layer of chicken litter, then put some wood shavings or something on top of that, then lay our little chicks and then cover them. And then we're gonna layer that up till it's about my size. And then you'll let it cook, move to the next bin. They need to go back and look at that. The one of the things that, that uh, when they start realizing how much they have to deal with, we're starting to see more tunnel composting, which is basically long bins. You elongate the bin, it's the same width. Um, we have a lot of problems with management in these scavengers. It's really hard to keep the buzzards and the coyotes out. So a lot of people are uh, then looking to do something different. We have some rotating drum composters. That one's actually in Delaware County, Oklahoma. Um, you can get cost share now to go back retrofit and uh, do a rotating drum. This is the eco drum system. Mark Hutchinson took this picture. Basically to size that you need 20 days from end to end. So you can take all those daily loadings depending on where you're at in the cycle. And uh, that's how you'll design your, your system. Why 20 days? In order to kill the influenza virus, you need to be over 130 degrees for 20 days. So that's the other thing they don't realize that just leaving them there for a couple of days and then hauling them off isn't gonna cut it. It really doesn't get rid of the viruses. So research needs, we need to go back and find out is this data actually accurate? And uh, tomorrow I should be in LaFleur County, Oklahoma, giving this talk, giving a similar talk. So one of the things I'm trying to get out in the state and collect some data to, to verify, my goodness, whether this is good or not. With that, oh, talk a little bit about layers. Layers are the completely opposite situation. They die at a pretty constant rate. We bring them in when they're almost fully grown birds at about 20 weeks of their life. And they die at a fairly linear rate of maybe one bird per uh, thousand birds. But if you've got, if you're a big egg laying farm in Arkansas with a million birds, that's still two tons a day, you know, for years. So it'd be a lot. Turkeys are a lot like the, um, the broilers in that they're, we, they have the same growth and death patterns, similar growth and death patterns, except for, we raise the hens and the toms in two different systems, and we raise the toms to much larger size. Um, and for the toms, we're collecting, this is back that cumulative mass per grow out. You can collect an astronomical amount of dead turkeys toward the end of their life, end of their grow out. With that, I can take any questions. That's my dog, George. He has been proclaimed by a blue hair college girl in Boomer Lake in Stillwater. It's the cutest dog in the world. So uh, you can ask him any questions. He's all ears. So. All right. Do I have any questions. online? Uh, you're good online. Uh. Any questions in the room for Doug? Um, okay. What is the thing that you want to ground for the ground? Just if the, those masses are right or close. What I'm really trying to do is work with producers to try to manage their compost bins. And I'm probably gonna convince a lot of them go to incineration or maybe this, the, the, the new technique because basically their bins are just too darn small. Um, when they would could get by with three bins, now they can, they're filling that up in one grow out. So what a lot of them are doing, they're either going, they're changing their, their uh, cake out buildings to the tunnel composting or they're buying an eco drum and then they're, they're going to do their hot compost in the eco drum and do the curing 
in the bins. So just trying to get back and find out whether the data we have is correct or not, close to correct. <laughs> Yeah, I will refer you back to this, our document when it finally comes out, probably the, our journal article, if you're ever familiar with working with Chesapeake Bay, it takes forever for everybody to agree. Uh, right now, we're still working with the modelers, so it'll probably be another couple of years. We do have some data on there. Um, I'm not going to say it's good. It's, all of this is hard to find. Um, I, uh, I could tell you the number that's in my head, but it's probably wrong, so I won't. But there, the data is out there is actually um, not your pre your predecessor in Minnesota. No, Larry, no, not Larry. Anyway, well, there is some data, and I think it was either out of Minnesota or Iowa. I'm not sure which. But anyway, there is some data there. I'll, I'll get with, back with me, and I'll I'll find that. The, the source for you. 